of drawing conclusions from principles and evidence. Those are the two major things that we're going to be looking at in these, um, in these kinds of activities. Okay, So we've got principles that we're going to look at today and we'll do a certain amount of examining of, of, uh, of evidence but we're going to look predominantly at the logic that we use in, in uh, making our decisions anyway. So it involves basically um, in, a, in a fairly stepwise process. That is you start from what you already know or what can be proven to you or demonstrated in some way to construct a new conclusion or to reevaluate someone else's conclusion. So the basic logic is that we start from the known and progress toward what has previously been unknown, hopefully using a form of logic that will allow us to, to defend the decisions that we, ultimately, that we ultimately reach. So there are basically two types of processes that we're going to be looking at here uh, over the next uh, couple of lectures. One of them is, is deductive reasoning and the other is inductive reasoning and they differ quite substantially substantially as we'll see and sense by the time we're done with um, with this particular segment of, um, of material. Um, deductive reasoning basically involves moving from the general toward the specific. That is, we start out with general assertions or general statements of truth and we derive from that progressively narrower, narrower, narrower conclusions that are more specific. And so deductive reasoning tends to move from, from general to specific as, for instance, from a general assertion or statement of truth to specific applications of that more general assertion or given condition. So we start with the general and we move toward the specific in this kind of a situation in deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning, which we're going to hold off on looking at until we get to the next tape, the next lecture, is actually the reverse. So in, in, the, in this case, what you do is you reason from specific givens um, or facts or observations, that which you know, to a more general kind of conclusion that encompasses or will explain the specifics that you've started with. So in, in the instance of deduction, we're moving from general assertions or knowns or truths to specifics. And in inductive reasoning, we're going the opposite direction. We're starting with nitty gritty detail that we can demonstrate or know or have observed or proved in one way or another. And we're moving from that toward a more generalized kind of conclusion. In that instance, the general conclusion can then be turned around to offer other possible explanations or predictions regarding future situations. There's one difference between the two forms of logic and it's actually a crucial distinction. One is the fact that deductive reasoning involves essentially certainty. That is, in, in, in inductive reasoning, you cannot reach a logically certain stake. The best you can achieve is a kind of a well-based or highly likely conclusion. And so in the, in the situations we'll be describing today, we're dealing here specifically with deductive reasoning and, and you can reach fairly certain specific situations, if A then B, and what that implies about the relation between A, B, C, and so forth. But in the instance of inductive reasoning that we'll be covering largely in the next tape, um, you will find that all we can do is give probabilistic statements. You see a little bit of that when you look at um, scientists trying to testify in a court of law. Because scientists, as you know, are operating ultimately in a range of uncertainty. They are pursuing the unknown. And the best any scientist typically will be able to give you is a statement of faith or probability. It is most likely that among A, B, C, D options, B is what's going to happen, or C, or whatever. But when a lawyer who's operating in terms of law where it's a black and white issue, it's either one or it's the other, tries to get a firm answer out of a scientist, the best he'll get is a statement of probability. And the, the meeting ground perhaps is the lawyer is going to have to be, be happy with a maximum or high probability statement out of the scientist, which is about all a scientist will typically render, which is it's most likely X, Y, and Z. But they're not going to say X, Y, and Z will happen because that would be deductively um, deductive reasoning towards certainty and that's not the realm within which scientists operate. So let's look then specifically at deductive reasoning and look at some of the, the um, elements that are involved here. This is a type of reasoning that is based on logical propositions. We make a statement and from that we reason toward a particular kind of, of analysis that we wish to, um, that we wish 
to reach here. And so the entire thing is going to be based on what are called propositions. And those propositions we're going to define essentially as the smallest unit of knowledge that can be judged either true or false. Okay, so a proposition is, is a statement, the smallest unit of knowledge that can be judged either true or false. It is raining outside. That's something we can confirm. We can stick our head outside or our hand and see whether we get wet or whether we see rain. Granting that, what I can assert then is if it rains, then my car gets wet. And later, if you were to say your car is wet, it may be tempting, can I properly conclude my car is wet so it has rained? That is not necessarily true. Here at the U of H, I'm sure at some point or another you've parked next to grass and then they've turned the sprinklers on and you come back and yeah, the grass is nicely watered, but so is that side of your car. So there's another situation where your car could get wet without it necessarily having rained. And that distinction, that, that difference between if it rains then my car gets wet is not reversible. That is, just because your car is wet does not necessarily mean that it has rained. And it's that distinction between the certainty of if it rains, then my car gets wet. That implies a kind of a unidirectional logic and certainty. So that if you, if you later say it's rained, therefore my car is wet, that we can defend logically. We can deduce that in terms of the basic principles of deductive reasoning. Where it gets tricky is the fact that you can't then take the conclusion and necessarily demonstrate that the antecedent, the condition that can produce that conclusion, actually did occur. And therein lies most of the difficulties that most of us have with deductive logic or with the propositional calculus if you want to think about it that way. What makes this of interest to cognitive psychologists is that people use propositions. We operate with those all the time um, and combinations of them in order to reach conclusions. You know, there is, there is an inherent logic to most of what we do um, in, in, a, in a given situation. And it often means that um, it offers a means by which to study humans' cognitive processes and their skills in reasoning. That is, if we can lay out the underlying philosophical logic of A leads to B leads to C, meaning that we can jump from A to C, assuming B to exist. How we do that basically is a key element in, in cognitive psychologists being able to study and understand the processes of reasoning that you and I engage in in, um, in, in our deductive reasoning. One type of that deductive reasoning is the part that we're going to focus on here today, and that is what's called conditional reasoning. Okay, It is a form of deductive reasoning, and in fact it's a primary form uh, of deductive reasoning. It's one of the key elements, and, and it's based on a very simple assertion, which I've already mouthed here, but we'll put on the screen for you, if A, then B. That's the, the underlying proposition on which conditional reasoning is, is based. It's typical of what I, I said just a minute ago. If it rains, then my car gets wet. A is rain, B is wetness of car, the status of your car. And at its simplest, I can say then, it has rained, it is A, and therefore my car is wet, thus B. Okay, that's the if A then B conclusion, and this is a, a deductively valid inference or conclusion. That is, um, we can separate, we, we can, if A then B is true, then if A occurs, we know that B follows. That's a lockstep process. But let's separate logic from correctness. There is a distinction there, and that's where we humans often get hung up. To be logically correct is not necessarily to be intuitively correct or to be, to be logical correct in, in what we're asserting. For instance, following that same form, I could make a statement such as, if it rains, then bananas turn pink. You know, we can start with that as a premise. And at its simplest, I can then say, it has rained, bananas are pink. Now this statement is logically correct, that is, it's deductively valid. Given that you've granted my initial premise, if it rains, then bananas are pink or turn pink then the fact that it has rained necessitates that we conclude that the bananas are now pink. But it also makes no sense. 
that is, this statement is logically correct, it's deductively valid, but it's foolish, I mean, it's nonsense. And therein lies the difference and the difficulty that we have. The difference between what is logically consistent in terms of what we're asserting and what the consequences of those assertions are, as opposed to whether that, consequent, that antecedent is in fact a logical statement of fact. And therein is where we actually should attack if we need to debate with somebody on a, on a given subject. If you argue with a psychotic and grant his or her initial assumption, you may well lose your argument and reach what we might call crazy decisions, crazy conclusions. So the question is, do you then stand there and debate with the, the psychotic about the conclusions that he's reached? And the answer is no. We don't attack in that way. Rather, what we do is to attack the premise if we're, gonna, if we're gonna try and destroy the logic, where we have to go after it is in the if phrase, not the then phrase. Because if you grant the if, and the initial if A then B, once that's granted, anything can logically be derived from that that is consistent with the initial premise. And so if you try to argue about the truthfulness of those, those deductions, you get nowhere, you're running in circles. Because the person you're arguing with will simply bring you back to the fact, well, you agreed if A then B. And the net result then is that we can spend a lot of time arguing in that situation. So basically, what we do in this kind of an argument is to attack the premise. We attack the, we attack the initial if statement, okay? Let's organize this in the following way. I'm gonna suggest an organizational scheme for you here that does the following. Okay, if we can take my picture off the screen for a few minutes here, because we're gonna work with that whole table. Let me show you what I have in mind here in this situation. Let's organize it this way. There are two parts that we can work with, basically, which I'm gonna put on the, on the top of the table here. We can work in an argument, in a logical argument, either with the antecedent, which is basically the if phrase in an if A then B, or we can work with the consequent, that is the, the then part of the statement, the B part of the if A then B. And there are two things that we can do with that, basically from a logical perspective. We can either work to affirm it, that is we can try to confirm what has been asserted, or we can try to deny it in some way. So those are our basic options. We either attack the antecedent or the consequent, and we try to either prove it or to disprove it. And so in this particular situation, let's try it out. Let's try the following. If we start with an assertion such as, this is a banana, that's our A part. Therefore, this is a fruit, okay? It's based on the assumption that, the underlying assumption that if, if it's a banana, then it's a fruit, okay? That's the, the assertion that's being made there. And in this case, this is valid reasoning. What we're doing there is doing what is called affirming the antecedent. So those are the two components that we're working with. That is, we're looking at a banana and the consequences of its being a banana. And so what we're doing in that kind of an argument is doing what is called affirming the antecedent. This is a banana, therefore this is a fruit. This is valid reasoning. That is, affirming the antecedent in general, in this kind of logic, is a valid point of argument. And if you are able to disconfirm or disprove the antecedent, you can win the argument, okay? If, if you're unable to affirm or if you can come up with a specific example that disproves the antecedent in this kind of a situation, you have won the argument, okay? Now, there is a, a, um, there's a second possibility, there's a fallacy that can occur here. Because now let's try the following kind of a logic. We're gonna wipe the slate clean, leaving that particular situation there, and we're gonna try the following. Initial premise is, this is a fruit. Therefore, this is a banana. Okay? I think you can already see the illogic in that particular situation. And this is basically invalid reasoning. It's not true. Just because something is a fruit does not necessarily mean it's a banana. It could be an apple, an orange, a lemon. I mean, you can list all the things it could be. So in this case, what we've actually engaged in is the consequence, and we have tried to affirm it. And that is not considered to be valid logic, okay? This is a fruit, therefore this is a banana. 
We are trying to affirm the consequence in that case. We've gone essentially, uh, this is B, therefore A. And that is not good logic because affirming the consequent is not valid argument. Witness the statements that you can see there. I mean, it's a fairly simple one, but you can see the, the illogic in that kind of a situation and the ease of being able to disprove it in that situation. So affirming the consequent is not considered to be good logic. And what we're dealing with there are what are called fallacies, which we're going to define essentially in the following way. That is, we've got four strategies, two of which we've looked at so far, one of which is to affirm the antecedent. That's good. That's a logical way to do it. Demonstrate the antecedent is true, the consequent will then follow. But if we try to affirm the consequent, what we're engaging in, what we're using are fallacies. We're using a fallacial, a fallacial, fallacious argument. And the net result then is a fallacy is a reasoned conclusion which is deductively invalid. Okay, a reasoned conclusion which is deductively invalid is what happens when you're trying to affirm the consequence. This is a fruit, therefore it is a banana, is a good example of that situation. There are two other possibilities, so we'll put our table back up and fill in the other two blocks. And that is this kind of a situation. Now, let's start with an assertion like this is not a banana. Therefore, this is not a fruit. Again, I think at a gut level, you can appreciate the, 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 the error in that situation, okay? This is invalid reasoning because in this case, what we're trying to do is to work with the antecedent and deny it. This is a banana is affirming the antecedent. This is not a banana is denying the antecedent. The problem is that it leads to fallacious argument. This is not a banana, therefore it is not a fruit. No, this might be an apple which is a fruit. So not being a banana does not necessarily mean that what you're working with isn't a fruit in that situation. So logically what we're trying to do there erroneously is to deny the antecedent, which is another form of erroneous uh, logic, uh, denying the antecedent. So we're going to scratch that one as an illegitimate form of, of logic. And finally, let's try this. This is not a fruit from which we can logically conclude, therefore, this is not a banana. Now in this particular situation, what we've done is to work with the consequence. We're dealing with fruitness in this situation and we're denying that it is a fruit. And therefore, what we have also by implication done is to deny that it's a banana. Since we've asserted correctly earlier that a banana is a fruit, if what we're working with is not a fruit, by implication, by logical deduction, it cannot be a banana. And so in this case, an equally legitimate form of, of valid reasoning is to deny the consequence. Deny the consequent. So you can argue validly either by affirming the antecedent, that is confirm that the A part is true, or you can deny that the B part is true. And those are the two major acceptable forms of logic in the, in the very fundamental if A then B kind of logic that is typically involved, okay? So two out of the four are deductively valid forms of reasoning and two, as crossed out on our table here, are deductively invalid forms. So that's the, that's the, the basic series of assertions that we're working with in this particular situation. And then we're gonna put you right into a test. So we're gonna to respond to the growing question, so what, who gives a rip? Well, in fact, let's show you how this might work. Wason and Johnson, I think it's Wason, uh, W-A-S-O-N, I presume it's Wason, it may be Wasson, but let's say Wason and Johnson Laird originally developed a very interesting set of tasks to develop and illustrate an interesting set of tasks to, to illustrate this particular set of four rules that we've just talked about and the implications that evolve from them. What the participants were given in this situation, oh, and let me just summarize here. So the other two that we've looked at now are denying the antecedent is not legitimate, but denying the consequent is another legitimate form of argument. So restating again the obvious, you can either affirm the antecedent or you can deny the consequent in this kind of logic and win the day logically. 
Johnson and um, Johnson, Laird, and Wason came up with the following kind of a game. The conditional reasoning, reasoning here is if A, then B. That's what we're going after. And what's given here are four cards with an R, a 5, an E, and a 4 on it. And we're going to give you some other helpful information in the test that we're going to perform here. Okay? Four cards and a rule. If a card has a consonant showing, then it has an even number on the reverse side. Keep that in mind. If a card has a consonant showing, then it has an even number on the reverse side. What cards should be turned to confirm the conditional statement? Among those four cards, what's the minimum number of cards you need to turn in order to affirm the initial assertion, which is if a card has a consonant showing, that's the A part, and the B part is then it has an even number on the reverse side. Think back to that table of the antecedent or the consequent and whether to try to argue to affirm or deny and that'll tell you which to look at here. But the antecedent is which. If a card has a consonant showing and when a consonant is showing what do we predict? What do we expect on the other side? an even number if the rule is true, if the assertion is true. So the most obvious card to turn then is R, right? That's the one that shows a consonant among the four that are there. So let's set that to a test given, it, given our particular table. We're going to set up the R and in this case the, the, the logic that we're using here is simply if or this is an R, therefore this has an even number. And what we're doing there is this. We are affirming the, the antecedent. It is a consonant and therefore it has an R. Uh, I'm sorry, therefore it has an even number on the reverse side. Assuming that's true, we have then demonstrated or failed to not demonstrate the logic that is involved there. So that is obviously one card that we can turn, okay, among the four, R, 5, E, and 4. That's a logical way to debate, and that's so far we're good. We're, we're, we're consistent. We've demonstrated consistency with what was originally inserted. If a consonant is showing, there's an even number on the other side. And if we find an even number on the R reverse, then we're okay so far. What else could we do? We had R, 5, E, and 4. What other card would you like to turn? By show of hands in the room, how many would opt for, I'll, in fact, I'll give you all three. How many would like to turn card five by show of hands? How many would like to turn card E by show of hands? And how many would like to turn card four by show of hands? Okay, that is the clear winner, a gazillion to nothing to nothing. And you're wrong you're wrong. Think that through a minute. The original assertion was if a consonant is showing an even number is on the other side. Is there anything in there that makes a statement about what's going to be on the opposite side of an even number? It does not say if an even number is showing there will be a consonant on the other side. It was unidirectional. If there's a consonant, there will be an even number. So in fact, what you're trying to do is to affirm the consequence if you use four. Okay? And we already decided that that was, um, that was bad logic in that situation. So let's rethink it. We've got R, 5, E, and 4 that we can turn. R we've turned and found a consonant. We're all grins. But there's a second half that we also have to worry about. What is the next card that you need to turn? I heard it mumbled on the microphone and you'll get credit for it. The five? Yes. Yes. In terms of the table, let's go back to the table and look at it for just a minute. The other thing that we have to do in terms of our table is to try to deny the consequent. 
So what we're going to do is look at the consequent. And in this case, if we have an odd number, that will allow us to deny. That gives us a test at denying the consequence, because now what we've done is to go to the consonant and test the opposite. So what we're going to try and do in this test is to deny the consequence. So in fact, the other number that you should, the other card that you should turn is the five. And in that case, assume it, because then the logic is this is a five, therefore this has no consonant. That is the implication of the original assertion. Okay, so when we flip the consonant, what we have to find is, uh, when we flip the five, what we have to five, find is no consonant. That's an odd number, therefore it cannot have a consonant there. And thus if we turn that over and we find a consonant, we've disproved it. We've disproved that the, the rule always applies. So in this case, assuming that we can deny the consequent, that would then win the case for us. And in fact, if we flip the five and in fact find a vowel, then we have, then we have, have um, in fact, demonstrated a consistency with the, with the logic. We failed to disprove it. So let's go ahead and look at the other two, okay? We've just, with, by flipping the five, which is the other one you need to turn, we have, in fact, denied the consequent, okay? Or we, actually, we failed to deny the consequent, thereby demonstrating that, in fact, it's true. But let's look at the, the other one that several people were biased toward was, um, was E. The logic there is, this is an E. Now this is a vowel. If we turn it, this is a non-competitor. It's a non-compete because the only thing the rule said was if a consonant is showing, there's an even number on the other side. It didn't say anything about what will be on the other side of vowels. So in fact, you know, therefore this has no consonant. That doesn't follow from the logic. But in fact, in this particular case, what we're trying to do is deny the antecedent. That is, we've taken an example which is not a consonant, and now we're trying to test it. And this is bad logic, because we didn't say anything about non-consonants. All we said was an assertion about the consonant itself. So flipping E is an assertion where we're trying to deny the antecedent. And as I said earlier, if you pick four, which, and you're right with America on that, the vast number of people faced with this try to go for the four as the other possibility. But in that case, it was the, what I'm referencing here is the non-reversibility of what we're working with here. This is a four, i.e. this is an even number. Doesn't say anything about therefore this has a consonant. That's the implicit prediction. But in fact, all the assertion said was if it has a consonant, there's an even number on the other side. So checking the even number doesn't guarantee there'll be a consonant on the other side. And thus, in this case, what we're trying to do is to affirm the consequent, which is not good logic. So the, the um, R5E4 problem is a very interesting application of the, of the basic principles that we were looking with there, using an antecedent and a consequent and trying to either affirm it or deny it in this situation. So the two, those two moves, the initial two moves, turning the, the, um, the consonant and the even number, are the only two that are necessary and sufficient to prove that the assertion is true. Because we've looked at the only two things that are involved. If there is a consonant on one side, there's an even number on the other side. And so we look only at the even number to make sure there's a consonant on the other side, and the consonant flip to make sure there is an even number on the reverse side there. Assuming both of those are true, we have then logically won our case in that situation. And the other two involve either denying the antecedent or affirming the consequent, which are not logical forms of, of uh, are not defensible forms of logic. Um, so basically the conclusion here is that many fewer people seem to recognize the need to test to deny the consequent. That is the other thing that you really have to do in, in a, in a well-founded logical argument in this situation. Let's jump into something you're more familiar with. Let's take the following, okay? If you, you've heard this on TV and in the newspapers, then we will, you will be given a thousand dollar rebate. If you buy this car, we will send you $1,000, says, says the dealer. Now, of course, what they fail to point out there is that you're borrowing an extra $1,000 to pay interest for five years on the money they're giving you free. All they've really done there is overcharge you $1,000 and then give you the upfront money right now. You're still paying money for it because it costs them money and they're not in the business of giving away money. They're in the business of selling cars. So you're paying $1,000 more than you should have, but at least you're getting $1,000 free. Well, it isn't free. You're paying the interest on it. So in this case, 
consider the example. Does this necessarily mean that if you don't buy the car, you won't get the rebate? No. Arguing that way, you're denying the antecedent. I didn't buy the car, therefore I won't get the $1,000. Dealer didn't say that. Dealer only said, if you buy this car, I will give you $1,000. There is nothing in there that prohibits that dealer from giving you $1,000. Nothing, absolutely nothing. What you're arguing if you try to, to defend that is you're denying the antecedent in that situation. I did not buy the car. Let's try it out. I won't get $1,000. No, that's not true. That's not in those assertions. If you buy that car, then you will be given $1,000. There's nothing in that one-two statement about the, to prevent the dealer from sending you $1,000 just for the heck of it. Nothing. So in essence, concluding I didn't buy, I won't get 1000 is denying the antecedent. You may still get the 1000 His financial system may do a backflip. The treasurer may be mad at the boss. There are a lot of ways in which you might end up with $1,000 from that dealer that don't necessarily obligate you to buy that car. Or suppose the, the, the dealer sends you the car, which is what we've essentially got there, sends you the $1,000. Does that mean that you bought the car? Set it up this way. If you buy this car, then you will be given $1,000. Same premise. The dealer sent me $1,000. I guess I bought the car. Is that logical? Given the initial premise, no, it's not. The fact that you end up with $1,000 does not necessarily mean that you bought the car. So in this case, what you're doing is affirming the consequent. I got the $1,000. The consequent has been affirmed. But it doesn't mean that the preface, the antecedent, has necessarily prevailed. So in this case, you're affirming the consequent, and, and it's illogic. This is a situation where everyday experience encourages us into a fallacious logic. But in fact, you're wrong. To say that you'll get $1,000 if you buy the car isn't to say anything to preclude you from getting $1,000 in many other ways. Kirby has done some recent work in, within the last decade or so that looks at this in, in a rather different way. And, and what he's arguing essentially is that people are far more prone to, um, to seek information to deny the consequent, the validity of it validly, in situations where the assertion is something like, if a person is drinking beer, then that person must be over 21 years of age, okay? If a person is drinking beer, then that person must be over 21 years of age, since the law in Texas right now is you have to be 21 to drink alcohol. The net result is that if you find someone who is drinking beer, we are much more likely to do it by trying to deny the consequent. So you're much more likely to check a 20-year-old's registration or, or driver's license than you are that of a six-year-old who walks up and tries to buy a beer. That is what we're doing that way, and it's good logic in that case, is we're trying to deny the consequent. You must be 21 in order to be drinking beer. And so what we look at is take people that are close and might be or might not be, and that's what we worry about. So what we're worrying about is the consequent in that particular argument, and we're trying to, to disprove the logic by demonstrating, look, here's a 19-year-old who's actually drinking. You, of course, have never participated in anything like that. But the logic, according to uh, Kirby, uh, in a 1994 argument, is, I think, correct. That is, that if you and I are the doorkeeper at a club, and I'm sure any of you, given your age, have gone through that situation before, where they're checking people very closely when they're right at that cut line about whether they should or should not be admitted to a, a um, 21 and older club. Um, now, how do we make decisions like this? Well, there are a lot of different things that are going on here, but the, the uh, denying the consequence uh, to disprove the assertion is a favorite strategy that we use in this kind of a situation. The more general question, though, is that in terms of day-to-day decision-making, um, Chang and, and Holyoke uh, in the mid-1980s studied how people like us, logical people, efficient people, dedicated people, described as normal people, apply deductive reasoning in our everyday world. That is, how do we go about making the decisions that we need to in this particular situation? And the answer is pretty straightforward. 
We tend to use the formal rules of logic, not at all. Rather, what we do is to use a series of self-developed, what are called pragmatic rules, okay? And so when we're making these kind of decisions, um, antecedent confirmation, consequent denial as the most logical form um, is what we are, are, are led to. But in fact, what we normally use is what are called pragmatic rules, the rules of operation, of daily operation. And we define those simply as general organizing pr principles or rules that are utilized for achieving particular kinds of goals, whether it's permissions or obligations or causations, demonstrating a causal relationship. This definition is drawn from, from Sternberg's 2006 book on, on cognitive psychology, but it's a relevant piece of, of information to keep in mind. And that is that the, they're not as abstract as the propositional calculus, as that formal logic is, is referred to, but they're widely applicable rules that you and I tend to operate with. They're not universally true, but they tend to square with reality and with our experience enough so that we have a lot of faith in them, but they are basically called pragmatic rules. They may or may not be logically developed, but they are certainly based on past experience. Our experience suggests this, that, and the other rule is, is correct. And so if past experience doesn't suggest an answer to us in any situation where we have to make a decision, we use our pragmatic rules to deduce what is basically a defensible interpretation of what we've observed. And so that's the situation. You see a situation, you use pragmatic rules to, to make a judgment about what's actually going on. It's not logically derived, it's simply based on common sense, if you want to call it that, and past experience. So let's suppose that you're the chairperson at a high school dance, okay? You are responsible for the sanctity and virtue of everybody in there and to make sure that they're following the rules. And so in essence, you observe a student and his date. You're watching the exit, the door, and you watch a student and his date come out of the dance get into a car and drive away. You're asked, how old is he? How old was the male who drove away? And in terms of state law, assuming I've still got that state law correct, and with a 17-year-old in the house now, a male, uh, I should be up on this. I'm not sure whether I am or not. I'll go back and check tonight. But in essence, what we have to assume then is that he is at least 16. If he's permitted to drive after dark, then he must be at least 16, if I remember the state rules correctly. But that's a pragmatic rule. That's something we've learned in talking to fellow parents or fellow students, uh, depending on which side of that dimension you're on. Um, but it's, just, it's purely pragmatic. It's based on, on what you understand about the law. And if you see somebody come out of the dance, get into a car and drive off after dark, the assumption is that, that um, it was a 16-year-old. Now, I'll show you another way in which pragmatics drop in there. Would you be more or less sure of that situation if that person whom you think is 16 comes out and gets into a snappy brand new Lincoln LS to drive off? Would that increase your surety that, oh, he's at least 16? And why? Another bit of experience, pragmatic rule operating here. Have to think that through a minute. Is it more likely that that's his car or his parents' car in a typical family? It's more likely to be his parents' car. So does that increase or decrease the likelihood that he is, in fact, at least 16? It increases it, yeah. If the parents have let him take that car, doggone sure he's at least 16. They're not going to put him in a brand new car on the road at 14. Okay, so that kind of, and again, what you see is we kind of build to a decision using pragmatic rules in that situation. If he'd gotten into a seedy seven-year-old rust bucket with dents on every major quadrant, we can more safely assume that's his car. And maybe he rolled it down the driveway silently under cover of dark, leaped in and roared off at the age of 15 or 15 years, nine months, or whatever. So in other words, in this case, what we can do is kind of build a logical case for the fact that the quality of the car can be used to essentially either affirm or draw into question the conclusion that we've reached there. But the pragmatic rules that are involved there are essentially your past experience and what you know generally to be true. When, when, when we drive our parents' car at age 15, 16, 17, we generally tend to be on the right side of the law because the parents are clearly obligated if you're not on the right side of the law and happen to get yourself in trouble. In fact, 
Chang and Holyoke in 1985, same study I cited earlier, found that 62% of college-age subjects utilize affirming the antecedent or denying the consequent arguments, that is the correct ones, um, when faced with permission statements um, that required conditional reasoning to solve. In the situation I just described, did that student have permission to drive that car? You tend to use either affirming the antecedent or denying the consequent logic to work your way through to realizing that yes, the likelihood is strong that that student was at least 16 years of age. Interestingly enough, however, only 11% suggested or, or identified such styles, selected such styles of reasoning when pragmatic reasoning skills are not drawn in by the subject matter that's being processed. Which is a long-winded way of saying that when you're looking at a 16-year-old or a male coming out under darkness from a dance and getting into a car, that pulls in your pragmatic situation, your pragmatic rules, but in fact, it could just as easily be the propositional calculus that you use in that situation. So how do we make decisions in the pragmatic world we face? Well, the answer is that some have suggested that although we don't always demonstrate direct application of the propositional calculus, we do use a kind of a natural logic that many draw on in, in such a situation. And they tend to have several different kinds of, of, um, of, of laws that we use in this, um, in this particular situation. Affirming the antecedent, I've already talked about as, as a, a way that we tend to, to operate in this situation. But there are several other contractual rules that we tend to, that we tend to fall on or, or rely upon. One of these is essentially permission kind of rules. If A, then B. If he's driving the car, then he has his parents' permission. Sorry, if he's driving his parents' car, then he has permission to do so, i.e. he's met the rules. And alternatively, what we also use are things that are, that are involving obligations of one sort or another. That is, um, if one thing occurs, then a second thing likely is true, likely has also occurred. If we see a male coming out of a dance under dark in high school, the likelihood is when he gets into a fancy car that he's driving his parents' car and that the parents have enforced the rules. No, you're not driving until you're 16 or whatever it happens to be. So in that case, we're, we're dealing with contract in a kind of a constricted sense. But you and I understand the rules under which parents tend to operate when we're getting close to driving age. And they're pretty strict about it because they're on the, on the, um, on the cuff just as much as you are if you get nailed for doing something wrong. We also then tend to use what are called causal rules, uh, and that's uh, sufficiently self-explanatory that I'm not going to go into it a great deal. But the last one, which is my favorite, is not immediately obvious. And that is one of the other ones that we also tend to use is what's called the law of large numbers. And this has buried in it a large number of fascinating ways in which we can screw up in one way or another. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. The larger the size of the sample, it is argued, the more probable any effect which is demonstrated is not a random event. If you have a large number of, of, uh, of samples of a given situation, the greater the likelihood that whatever you conclude from those observations, in fact, actually approximates the truth. That is, it was not a chance occurrence. It was not a random event. To explain this law, I need to uh, anticipate something we'll talk about later. Let me flip a coin. If I flip that coin and end up producing six tails in a row, many people, including gamblers, believe that the odds are greater than 50-50 that the next toss will be ahead. Okay? If I flipped a coin six times in a row and I've gotten six tails, what are the odds I'll get heads on the seventh toss? They're exactly 50-50. What's committed there in that situation is what's called the gambler's fallacy. That is one of the laws of, of, of large numbers, one of the implications of, of the laws of, of large numbers. It tends to, to lead people into wrong logic in that situation. The logic behind this is fairly straightforward if you really push people when they argue that, well, no, it's got to be a head. It's been six tails in a row. Well, in essence, if a coin is fair, it is argued, then it must be the case that in the long run, it will produce an equal number of heads and tails. And if we've just built up six tails in a row, 
simply in terms of normal expectations, it's got to be a hit because we're, gonna, we're not going to allow it to get to 20 or 30 or 40 tails in a row with an unbiased coin. Wrong. If no heads have appeared for a while, then to maintain fairness, the coin must land on the head. No. Does the coin have a memory? No. And so in essence, each, there's no process by which the outcome of prior tosses can influence the outcome of the next one. Each event is a random toss, assuming you have an unbiased coin. Each flip is completely without impact from the other sequences. It has no memory of what the coin has previously done. And so it's 50-50, whether it lands on heads or tails. Toss number seven is just as likely, it's equally likely to be heads or tails. It's still 50-50. At the 20th coin toss, it's still 50-50 as to what's going to happen. The error of the logic then lies in the thinker's assumption of what is called category homogeneity. That's where the flaw is. It's correct, the logic, that in the long run, an unbiased coin will fall heads and tails half the time. Half the time heads, half the time tails. But the assertion applies only to all tosses. It is an attribute of the whole category of tosses, not individual tosses within. Okay? The odds that it will be heads or tails are exactly 50-50, again, assuming you have an unbiased coin. But for any individual toss, if you've had six in a row of one, doesn't impact at all the likelihood that you'll get that same event on the seventh occur occurrence. The error in logic is in assuming that the homogeneity of balanced numbers of heads and tails applies to any subset of the totality of tosses. That is, that a representative sample of the entire category will have all of the category's properties, all of the category's properties. And the answer is no. If you take any subset of, of tosses from a given sequence, it may or may not share the attributes which the entire sequence tosses. You have probably seen the binomial expansion at one time or another, which is the likelihood that if you do two events, you know, if one of two events can occur and you go a sample, a sample length, there are various probabilities that you will get a run of one in a row, two in a row, three in a row, and so forth. The probability of getting, you know, flipping a coin, of getting 20 heads in a row is small. But if we look at the entire flip of, of you know, 10,000 coin flips, the odds are pretty high that you could drop in somewhere and find 20 heads in a row or 20 tails in a row. Because the idea of fairness, equality of heads and tails, is not applying to an individual event. At the extreme, it can't. Any one event has to be a head or a tail. And so at the extreme, with one event, it can't possibly share 50-50. What's it going to do, land on its edge each time? Well, it's a head, no, it's a tail. Doesn't work. Let's push that. Let me toss my coin four times. Not 100, not six, four times. Will I get a 50-50 split? Will I get a 50-50 split, two heads, two tails, in tossing it four times? Well, in fact, you may have seen a table at some time where somebody has actually worked that out. Um, and the odds are one in five that you will get two heads and two tails. Because there are five possible options. Again, I'm flipping a coin that is either going to land heads or tails. And in that situation, there are five options. No heads, four tails, one head, three tails, two heads, two tails, three heads, one tail. Am I going the right way? Four heads, no tails. Okay? Those are the five possible outcomes when you're tossing four coins that are either or. So the odds are actually only one in five that you'll get an actual split 50-50. Or the other way to look at that is the flipping four coins where 50-50 is what we expect. 80% of the time, that's not what you're going to find. 80% of the time, that 50-50 attribute is not going to be reflected in the data that you get. That's where things like the gambler's fallacy begins to creep in, where the, the assumption of category homogeneity begins to get you, you, um, you in trouble. Some of the sequences are 25% heads or no heads. They're equally likely in terms of one of the five events that is going to occur there. 
This provided the basis for explaining the law of large numbers. This provides the basis for explaining the law of large numbers. If we study a large number of coin flips, we will tend to see splits that are close to 50-50. But the key word there is tend. There is no reciprocal law of small numbers. When we talk about the law of large numbers, it doesn't guarantee that there is a law of small numbers. In fact, there is not. Small samples, though expected to, do not always mirror the attributes of the larger population from which they're drawn. Just gave you the example of flipping our coin only four times. And yeah, we expect 50-50, but only 20% of the results in repeated tosses of four coins are actually gonna be a 50-50 split. Small samples do not always mirror the attributes of the larger sample from which they are drawn. Kahneman and Tversky, who've done a lot of studies in this particular area, provide a very nice example that, that will, I think, drive the point home for you. They say, in a small town nearby, there are two hospitals. Hospital A has an average of 45 births per day. That's not a small town hospital, but for argument, 45 births a day. Hospital B is smaller and has an average of 15 births per day. As we all know, overall the number of males born is right at 50%. Worldwide right now it's actually slightly below that, speaking of odds that are not where they're supposed to be. Um, each hospital recorded the number of days in which on that day at least 60% of the babies born were male. Which hospital recorded more such days? Hospital A, the bigger one, or Hospital B, or were they both equal? Again, we've got one hospital that has 45 births a day, a second one has 15 births a day, and what they recorded is a situation where 60% or more of the babies born on a day are males. Which hospital reports more such days? Hospital A, the big one, 45 births a day, or hospital B, the smaller one with 15 births a day? Or is it equal? Most people will select C, they're equal. Without the, the lead in that I've already given you, I've kind of primed you as to what the answer is going to be there. But in essence, the larger the sample we study, the closer to the theoretical ideal we approach. The bigger the sample, the closer to ideal 50-50 split. Ideal is the wrong word to use there. The predicted um, we approach. But the smaller the sample, in this case the obverse is true, the smaller the sample, the further from the ideal we are likely to wander. This is where the law of small numbers does not lead to a, a logical kind of conclusion here. Days with greater than 60% males are much more likely at the smaller hospital. Take an extreme case. One hospital has 1,500 births a day. Now that's outrageous. No hospital has that many. But let's argue for the sake that one hospital has 1,500 births a day. What are the odds that you'll see 90% plus of the births of males in a day? and you'd immediately acknowledge that's highly unlikely. Okay, 1,350 males, 150 females. That would make the, uh, the Today Show, no doubt. That would be interesting news. It's, it's highly unlikely when you've got 1,500 births that you're working with there. But look at the other extreme. A hospital with only one birth per day, by contrast, will exceed that limit perhaps as much as 50% of the time they are going to have more than 50% males born on a given day. Because in fact, the only thing they can report is either 100% males or 0% males. So in that case, the smaller the hospital gets, the greater the odds that we're going to have a deviation in a wildly unexpected direction. That is, you move toward 100%. It's either always male or never male on a particular day. So there's a failure here to take sample size into account. That comes back to why the gambler's fallacy tends to occur. Many people expect any sample to show all of the properties of the population from which they're drawn. But I've just worked through rather painfully a very specific example of where it doesn't. This, the logic simply does not follow through when we're dealing with average number of male-female births in a large versus a small uh, situation. Clearly, when you're dealing with a small sample, the odds are thrown, are skewed significantly toward an extreme one way or the other. Which leads us then to another form of logic that we need to get into here, another component of the logic that we're looking at here, and that is the importance of falsification. 
So far, all we've talked about is deductive, lockstep, loctite kind of logic, deductive reasoning. Before moving to syllogistic reasoning, which we're going to cover in the next tape, I wanted to interject a cautionary note here for all of you blossoming deductive and inductive reasoners offering two bits of advice which are free. And as my father used to say, free advice is worth every penny you paid for it. But the points are twofold. That is, in the first situation, there may be times, the, the first piece of advice I want to give you in this kind of thing is, that there may be times when it's better not to solve a problem than to solve it. There may be easier ways to handle the, the particular situation that presents itself. So in some situations, it may be better not to solve the problem. And secondly, there may be times when it's more important to identify an exception than a confirmation to the demands of the problem. So in some cases, we don't even want to prove the problem. Rather, what we want to do is to disprove it. It's more important to work to find an exception than it is to, to work to prove the problem. Deductive problems and syllogisms, of which we'll talk more later, um, were not developed by psychologists. And they were not created to understand cognitive processes. We need to understand that at the, at the get-go. Wason, whose work we looked at earlier, um, the four cards problem, has invented a number of interesting problems developed to analyze specific aspects of reasoning. That is, looking at what we go about doing when we're faced with a particular kind of problem. So he's taking the logic and then trying to reintroduce psychology into it. One of the types of problems that he's looked at are what are called generative problems. I'm going to just show you a, a series of different types of problems in the, in the coming um, uh, points here. It's based on people not passively receiving information that they must rearrange to find a solution. You and I are not passive receptors of problem-related information. We're making assumptions. I showed you one um, a couple of tapes back called the, three, the nine dots problem, where you, in fact, added a rule, or many people add a rule about the, you know, you've got nine dots determining a square, and people just automatically assume, well, you can't go outside the square. And if you make that as a rule for yourself, once you saw the solution, you realize you can't solve the problem. So you and I are not passively leaping only into logical analyses. There are other things we're doing in this kind of a situation. And in this particular situation, generative problems involve ones where, where people have to generate their own possible answers. Okay, I'm going to pose for you a problem here, and when you make a guess, I would like to request that you do so on mic. That is, I want people to hear as if they're right here in the classroom some of the things that, that you may suggest here. Okay, so what Wason did in, in this particular problem solving situation was to pose the following kind of a problem to people the numbers two, four, six as a three number sequence conform to a simple relational rule that I have in mind. Your task is to find what that rule is. What rule have I created in my head that will explain where two, four, six becomes an acceptable answer to that, a solution to that particular problem? And I'd like you to offer up comments on mic, and I'll, I'll simply tell you specifically in response to any sequence you want to give me whether you're right or wrong. That is, whether the number you supplied is consistent with my rule or not. Your turn. What is the rule that I have in mind? And by guessing number sequences, you will eventually be able to determine what that sequence is. This is where senior faculty like me are bold enough to simply sit back and wait. I will outwait you, and we may do 20 minutes of silence here. Yes. 10, 12, 14. <laughs> yes, that, is, that follows my rule. 10, 12, 14 follows my rule. Other candidates? U of H is paying big money for this. Give me some other candidates. Two, four, six, and 10, 12, 14 follow my rule perfectly. Name some other candidates and see whether you can come up with one so as to identify the rule. 4, 8, 12. 4, 8, 12, yes. That follows my rule. Yep. 10, 12, 14, and 4, 8, 12 specifically follow my rule. So we got two very solid affirmations. But what's the rule? That's the goal here. 
Go ahead. Is it even numbers? Even numbers? No. The question was, is the rule even numbers? No. There'd be a very simple way to check that out. Yeah. 579. 579 follows my rule, which thus makes it, yes. 5, 10, 15. Follows my rule, yes. 5, 10, 15 follows my rule. Uh, 5, 3, 1. Does not follow my rule. 5, 3, 1 does not follow my rule. Now, there are still several candidates that are available, given that one exception. Yes. 255075? Follows my rule. Follows my rule. 255075 follows my rule. Now, remember, the goal here is to discover what the rule is. How else can you test it? How else can you find the limits? One, two, three. One, two, three follows my rule. It has to increase all the numbers. That is a rule. The question is whether it's the right rule. He's arguing the, the rule is the numbers have to, go ahead. Negative infinity, zero, and infinity. I didn't hear the last. Negative infinity, zero. Infinity, plus infinity. Follows the rule. Well, I might have to argue whether those are odd numbers or even on the end, but that's, that's inconsequential. <laughs> yes, that, that series <laughs> follows the rule. What's the rule? I'm waiting. Remember what I said here. There were two points that I made coming into this. There may be times when it's better not to solve the problem than to solve it. And there may be times when it's more important to identify exceptions to the rule than those that follow the rule. And you're right in the middle of a classic example of that. It would seem to me that the way to solve this is to pose a lot of different series and see what you can find by way of what qualifies and what doesn't. And everybody's just sitting there. Yes? 50, 30, 87. Does not follow my rule. 50, 30, 87 does not follow my rule. Go ahead. Do they have to just be three numbers that increase every time? Well, check it out. The idea is they have to be three numbers that increase. That's another proposal. Yeah. 10, 230, and 500. Follows the rule. So we've had gaps among the numbers increasing from one to infinity, and the answer has been that it fits the rule in each case. Yes? 500, 20, and 57. Does not follow the rule. Want to try another one? Negative three, negative two, negative one. Negative three, negative two, negative one follows my rule. At least, go ahead. One, three, ten. Follows my rule. One, three, ten follows the rule. Yes. Um, three, six, nine, twelve, fourteen. Follows the rule. Three, six, nine, twelve, fourteen follows the rule.
as detectives, you're flunking. <laughs> and I've even given you the hint. Go ahead. So is it better not to solve it? No, no. <laughs> the issue is how you go about solving it. Some, somebody else had a comment? Well, I was just saying that it has to be um, numbers that increase and never decrease. Okay. I agree with that, but how do you prove it? Because the numbers that you've been given that decrease at a certain point are not following the rules. Yes, if there's an uneven progression or if they're in decline, the answer is no, they don't follow the rules. But think back to the way in which you've solved that problem. That is the rule. My rule was simply any progressing series of numbers. There can be no step back. Any increasing series of numbers. But if you think about the solutions that you propose there, time and again you kept coming up with rules that affirm which doesn't tell you nearly as much as the one that nobody ever asked, three, two, one. Negative three, negative two, negative one is good, but it is increasing. Three, two, one, however, is decreasing. And that would have elicited a clear no. And so in essence, what, what happens there is that, that uh, it's kind of the way science often tends to proceed, proceed and that is that we, we develop a theory and then we do the research to try and prove it. And so when we get data that disagrees, we, well, that was measurement error that we, we don't quite understand, but it didn't fit. And so we throw it out. And in fact, in this instance, what, what was really happening there, if, if you think back to the number sequences that were generated, I think if I remember, there were only two that involved negation or, or a decline rather than an increase. And in both instances, it elicited the correct answer was no, that doesn't fit. There were, however, still several logical premises. It might have been evenness. You eventually eliminated that by jumping to 5, 10, 15. It might have been odd number or even numbers only. That was eliminated. But in fact, all you were doing was finding rules that, that fit the increase instead of coming up with, with when you found a no, what you should do is to identify with what is it about that example that was different from the others that were offered. Because what you're really doing in that case is trying to find exceptions to the rules, and that ultimately leads you to the correct information, which is, okay, if it's, if it's an increasing series, and it really doesn't matter. I mean, the extreme was clever. Minus infinity, zero infinity. That told you that you know, the gap didn't matter. It was simply the, the increase that was important in that situation. Had she said the same thing in reverse order, infinity, zero, minus infinity, the answer would be no, it did not. None of you even took a reverse of the numbers that had been used. So there were several ways to, to back into it there, but I come back and make the original points, and that is in some cases, it may be better not to try to prove the rule. It's better not to solve the, prove the rule in a situation, but rather what you may want to seek to find is, is exceptions to the rule, because that will in many instances be instructive. One of the instructors in, in a uh, structural engineering class here at the University of Houston encourages his, her, his students to build structures and then ultimately in that stress analysis class, they put it under significant stress and push the structure to the point where it fails. The point being that in many instances in failure, his students learn more than they do by building a successful model because until you understand the limits of what a particular structure does, you don't really understand where its weak points are. And I've always found that a very instructive, interesting kind of logic that we build something to fail because we learn more out of failure in some ways than we do out of, uh, out of success. So in essence, Wason was, was, um, was pointing out that the guesses to that kind of a problem typically were only attempts to positively identify the rule. Most of them that you guessed were ascending series, and I put that right in my notes here, and sure enough, that's what happens in that kind of a, a situation. In this case, it was necessary to think of series that would disconfirm the rule in order to learn what, they, what the limits of the actual rule that I had developed were. Any increasing series of numbers was the only rule that was involved. What's required here is what is referred to simply as an, as an eliminative, eliminative strategy, okay? You have to identify the exception to truly understand the nature and the power of the rule that has actually been developed in that situation. But many of the, the questions that you asked were simply reaffirming uh, what's called a confirmation bias. We have a natural inclination to try to confirm, okay, this model fits, this one fits, this one fits, this one fits. But what is it fitting? 
was the issue there. And to, to really understand what the rule was, what you had to do was come up with, with a series of, of uh, non-confirming answers in order to really understand the nature and the limits of what the rule was that I, that I actually had. And then this one always drives me buggy. So bear with me while I get confused in explaining this to you. I don't know why I always have trouble with this problem. A very creative thing developed again by Wason uh, called the Thog problem. The Thog problem is really quite simple to explain to you and there are other ways to explain it that make it easier than the way I'm about to show you. But this is the classic way that the Thog problem is presented to you. And if I can time this just right, I won't give you the answer till the next next lecture so that it bugs you like it has me many, many times. We are going to put up here a black diamond, a white diamond, a black circle, and a white circle. And then I'm going to tell you that. So we've given you the name of a color and a shape. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick in my head a particular name and particular color and I'm going to tell you in this situation, if BD, black diamond, is a thog, what can you say about each of the others? That's the thog problem. I've written down the name of one of the colors, white or black, and one of the shapes, circle or diamond. If and only if a design includes either the color I've listed or the shape, but not both, then it's a thog. So what can you say about each of the other three shapes? If the black diamond is a thog, which of the others is also a thog? That's one you have to think about a little bit to really appreciate. If and only if it's a design that includes either the color I've listed or the shape, but not both, then it also is a thog. If the black diamond, which it is, is a thog, then what can you tell me about the other three shapes? Is the white diamond a thog? intuitive errors, which you're already head nodding your way into, lead you to the wrong answer here. Because it tends to make people believe that the white diamond and the black circle are thogs. And the white circle is not. That's the general assertion. But think back, what have I actually written down that makes the black diamond a qualifier? I've listed a, a color and a shape. And it becomes a thog only if one but not both of the things I have written down are present. In other words, you qualify in this case to be a thog by a kind of a, a mutual exclusive rule. You have to have either blackness or diamondness, but not both in order to qualify as a thog. silence in the studio I'm hearing here. Well, let's go through and look at it here. Actually, what's written down? One color and one shape. If black and circle, then we would say that white circle is a thog because it has circleness but not blackness. Black circle is not because it has both. White diamond is not because it has neither. So if we wrote down black and circle, then in fact, that logic applies. Let's look at another situation. If white and diamond have been written down, then white circle is a thog because it includes whiteness but not diamondness. Black circle is not because it has neither, and white diamond is not because it has both. Notice, consistent with deductive logic here, that a specific necessary defensible answer can be derived from this problem. 
and I'm going to leave you until the next tape to puzzle out what is the correct answer. Because all I've told you in this case is I've written down a color and a shape and I'm telling you that a black diamond is a thog. Your challenge between now and tape 22 is comment on each of the other shapes in the puzzle.